I have been real sad. Actually, I'm not retiring. I'm returning home. I'm returning to my church. I'm returning to my family. I got grandchildren. I'm returning to my passion. My calling is to express the love. It's that love, that power of love that can transform minds and hearts. There's no better place for that transformation, in my opinion, to take place than in the church with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You will still be in public life? No, oh, I'll be in public life. I'll be working hand in hand with um, someone who will replace me. I'll be working hand in hand with other members of Congress. You know, I'll be making my, uh, bringing my knowledge, making my voice heard. I'm expanding these guardrails of the Congress is just going to allow me to be more effective in greater ways. Look, there is not a rocking chair or an easy chair that's been created that would be able to contain me. I tell everybody <laughs> that before I was a Black Panther, I was a Boy Scout. Then I went into the military. Four years, seven months, 28 days. You know, uh, who's counting, right? <laughs> and then I, I joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and then Panther Party, all right? And then a public official elected to uh, Congress. I started out as a member of the Chicago City Council, almost 10 years, and then Congress. And now I'm a pastor of a church. I'm, I come from the black condition, so I love black people, but I also love humanity. No one had even in the first instance questioned my stance as a race politician. They knew I was going to ask the black questions in the committee. I'm sitting on the dais along with other members of Congress, mostly white men, and I'm the only one that, well, how many black members are in uh, corporations, are in your association, Mr. Gas uh, Industry Chief, you know? And they turn beet red. But I'm the only one asking, asking those questions. My white counterparts now, they expect those questions to be asked. They're not offended. They know that those questions are questions around justice and economic uh, uh, equality. Sometimes I hear myself, oh, you sound bad. But then I quickly move to what I was speaking about, to what I'm doing in, the, in that very moment. Having cancer is a celebratory plan. Having your throat literally cut Losing the capacity to project, having the quality of your life, of your voice compromised severely, uh, is really a test, ultimately, of your heart. Are you hurt when people call you Congressman Mumbles? Are you hurt when people... No, no but I mean, Mommy Hush. <laughs> Am I hurt by that? Yeah, my vanity is hurt. My flesh is hurt. Uh, everybody wants to speak well, and I know the importance of public speaking well. But people who, who dismiss me, I have found that it's always been my advantage. I have had my, some of my best battles and some of my most glorious uh, victories against people who uh, underestimated me because of my speech pattern. Again, the key I look at Moses who had speech impediment, although he 
had to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. He spoke directly with God the Creator. Paul, who wrote more books in the Bible than any other man in the Bible, had a, a speech deficiency. My fight with cancer and my so being a cancer survivor has reinforced in me a more intense way that I that my that my purpose in life is to give my life to others. I introduced that based on the tragic death of Melanie Block Stoker here in uh, Chicago, who lived in the Lake Meadows uh, area of Chicago. And because of her postpartum condition, she committed suicide. And there was no uh, focus on postpartum uh, depression among women until my meal really kind of galvanized a lot of activity uh, and a lot of focus. And uh, was ultimately included in, in the Obamacare Act. We really passed the legislation uh, that I call the toy mill that made manufacturers liable for toys that threatened the safety and welfare and the lives of uh, children. I brought some bacon home, a lot of bacon. 95th Street uh, Station. We brought money home. That 95th Street Station was redone, rebuilt, based on federal dollars that I was responsible for bringing in. And the two interchanges, I 57 and I 294, they were the only two interchanges in the nation that did not connect. One ran over the other, and, and I, through the pleadings of some of my mayors in the suburban area, I got federal dollars to make sure that we connected the uh, I-57 and I-294 interchange. I have worked to create the Beloved Community Family Wellness Center, which is a friendly, qualified health center in Inglewood, in the Chatham community. I helped and led the charge after him. This tragic murder of the teacher, Dr. Betty Howard, uh, after her assassination, I brought the city together for monies and for the idea to create the greater Chatham Initiative, which is a local development corporation. The University of Chicago Trauma Center, I was in the forefront of that movement to create a trauma center on the south side. Early 90s, 1990s, there was a young homeless black man by the name of Joseph Boo. He sold uh, street-wise newspapers, but he also hustled by washing windows. So he was on, you know, on the Rush Street area on the Gold Coast one Saturday evening, and he walked up to this couple who had just come out of this lounge, this white police officer, uh, Gregory Becker. Becker was uh, off duty at the time, but somehow Becker pulled up a gun out of his uh, and killed Joseph Gould. But this was prior to George Floyd. Mm. And this was prior to Black Lives Matter. I led the charge in Chicago to focus on this black homeless man being killed by this white police officer. And he would have gotten away with it had I not led public demonstration uh, around the murder of Joseph Gould. Just because someone wears 
a hoodie does not make them a hula. Trayvon Martin, Kiel Martin's white races in Florida. And George Zimmerman was not being charged, and there was movement, there was outcry all over the nation, all over the world about the murder of this 17 year old innocent young man who was ill. The best way for me to show my solidarity with the young fighters for justice and equality was to put that hoodie the on, on the floor of the house and Jesus. let them, let the whole world the see that oh no, and I'm a member of Congress, I'm still a black man in America the, the who's fighting for words. justice. And he has shown you, old man, the member will what is suspend. good, the chair must remind what does not, what does the Lord of require of you, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So let me just kind of remind you that the Black Panther Party was the first one to really frame what we call the Rainbow Coalition. We went and organized poor people using that experience, that layer. When I went into Congress, I saw Republicans, I saw Democrats, but I saw human beings. I saw blacks, I saw whites, I saw Latinos, I saw human beings. Every anniversary on December the 4th or close to it, I went to the floor of the House of Representatives, the U.S. Congress, stood in that will, will and, and charged this nation with assassinating Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. I did that. And now, um, it, that has also come full circle in and, terms of, of, of recognition. Right, and recognition, and I am... Um, how do you feel about that? Now there are streets named after Fred Hampton. Well, how I feel about it is that I, I want to pass my bill after 50 plus years would uh, open up the government files on the FBI's counterintelligence program. Let's see how many Americans the J. Edgar Hoover had killed, was he responsible for? I want to get those files exposed, but I also want to get Jagger Hoover's name off the federal building, the FBI headquarters in Washington, D.C. I'm going to get that done. I'm going to get the uh, immaterial uh, anti lynching act done. I got a, a year or more remaining, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get this bill passed. There's no federal law against lynching in America. We got more black elected officials now, today, than in the history of this nation. But we got less power. And I was excited to have a black man and a black family in the White House. And that excitement has not been abated. Positionally, uh, we, the black community and America, really uh, made significant steps. However, programmatically, we got a long, long way to go. I'm somewhat disappointed. We have less black owned banks than we had in the 1950s. Today, I, I said as a chairman of the subcommittee on energy and power. In the energy sector, it's all white owned, white control. And the system is a mess as it relates to uh, equality, economic equality, be it health care, be it uh, communications, be it energy, be it uh, uh, education. All the sectors, we're still so far behind. We're left out. Although we have more black elected officials, Congress is not going to liberate 
black people. Ain't no federal law going on in the end and the end of the day liberate black people, equalize or create an equal society. I learned in the Panther Party that for every determination, there, uh, there's a limitation. And being a member of Congress, although it's powerful, it can be very limited. So it sounds like you might be uh, leaving Congress, but not leaving the, the battlefield. Oh, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm growing my horizon, growing my territory, expanding the tents of my territory, and I think I'll be more effective because I have the gift of a 75-year-old, and that's wisdom. I know what I know, and I know how to do what I am called to do much better.